Right. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, today, about 12.43, I believe, the European Parliament's position on the Artificial Intelligence Act was adopted in plenary with a large majority. And now, without further ado, let's hear from some of the key players. We have the co-operators as well as the President of the Parliament with us today. So, uh, so Roberta, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Before coming here, I thought I would ask uh, ChatGPT what I should say <laughs> about artificial uh, intelligence, and it gave me this answer. I suggest you to highlight the importance of responsible AI development and usage. You could talk about the potential benefits of AI in improving efficiency and solving complex problems, but also address concerns around privacy, bias, and job displacement. You could also emphasize the need for collaboration between policymakers, industry experts, and the public to ensure that AI is developed in a way that benefits society as a whole. I think the answer shows that artificial intelligence is already very much part of our daily lives. Uh, moreover, it raised a number of questions related to ethics, scrutiny, innovation, and the essential need to get the right regulatory framework in place. So now let me, as a real person, thank Brando Benife and Dragos Tudorake for your hard work. How many hours, days, nights it took, how many hours, days and nights it will still take for your hard work and for having found a balanced and human-centered approach to the world's first AI Act legislation that will no doubt be setting the global standard for years to come. I thank also the members, the administrators and assistants who worked so tirelessly to reach an agreement on this first set of regulations to manage risk and develop lawful use of AI. And all of this is perfectly consistent with our will to be world leaders in digital innovation based on EU values such as privacy and respect for fundamental rights. I think we can all be proud of ourselves. Europe is leading and will continue to lead in AI legislation. I will just make a couple of observations before handing over to the um, co-rapporteurs. First of all, technology evolves. Innovation brings us forward and opens up new possibilities. And as legislators, we need to seize the opportunity. It is about change. It is about understanding that we cannot afford to remain stagnant and about not being afraid of the future. Second, going forward, we are going to need constant, clear boundaries and limits to artificial intelligence. And here there is one thing that we will not compromise on. Anytime technology advances, it must go hand in hand with our fundamental rights and democratic values. And finally, we must reconsider how we legislate and think in the face of unlimited access to artificial intelligence because a new age of scrutiny has begun. So there are many things that cannot be digitalized, emotions, will, and judgment. All this belongs to us, to this house, which has the ability to set the tone worldwide. This is all about Europe taking the lead, and we do it our way, responsibly. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Brando, please. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you, President. I think we have made history today. Uh, we have set the way for uh, the dialogue that we will need to have. We started having with the rest of the world on how we can build responsible AI for um, our globe, for the systemic risks that this uh, can entail, but also thinking of everyday citizens, consumers, businesses, institutions that need to be supported in having an intake of AI so that they can get the best out of the AI, get all the opportunities out of that, but also be sure that they can trust that the institutions have built a system of safeguards that can identify the real risks, not overburden AI when it's not needed to do uh, unnecessary checks, but do very serious uh, 
conformity assessment when there is a high risk for health, safety, and fundamental rights. And we did have also the courage, also expanding with the vote of the European Parliament in this direction, to ban, to forbid those uses that we think are uh, not to be accepted, that are unacceptable, unbearable risks in our uh, uh, context because we think they go against EU values. Today we had a, a last minute uh, divergence in the Parliament on one point that on which the committee proposal, the one we worked on with uh, Dragos, has prevailed on maintaining a clear ban on real-time uh, biometric identification. There was the tentative to politicize this, to transform this in a propaganda tool, but we have won in the parliament to maintain uh, a clear uh, uh, safeguard to avoid any risk of mass surveillance. And at the same time, maintain the possibility um, with the non-real-time biometric identification to pursue uh, criminals and any risks that we have in society. Uh, we have also uh, proposed, uh, as you know, something that was not there in Commission text and was not in the text of the Council. We have gone much further on the reg 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 regulation of generative AI and general purpose AI and foundation models. We have put some important elements on the table and we need to be clear that no voluntary initiative, no uh, global effort to coordinate, which is crucial, I said it at the beginning, will hinder or influence in a limit, limiting way the work that we are doing to have strong legislation, especially on transparency in this case, when we deal with generative AI. We want uh, content that is produced by AI to be recognizable as such, and we want deep fakes not to poison our uh, 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 democracy. So there, there are a lot of issues where we, we have worked also to enhance the proposal of the Commission. Now we will go to trilogues already tonight. We will start this, this work so that we can deliver in, uh, in time for this uh, uh, parliamentary uh, mandate to be able to conclude uh, this work. This is what uh, we want uh, 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 to do and uh, this, is, this will be our commitment. Thank you. Thank you. And Dagos, please. <coughs> Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, President, for being with us here. Thank you, Brando, very much for the work that we've done together to get us to today. Of course, still a lot of work ahead of us uh, with the Council, but already today I think the signal, the political signal that we're sending is a very, very important one. Three points that I want to make uh, to complement what uh, President Metzola and, and uh, Brando have already said. One is balance. The one thing that we have uh, from the very first conversation that I've had with Brando preparing to go into the work with the shadows, the one thing that we wanted to achieve with this text is balance. Yes, it's true. The main objective stated already in the Commission proposal was that this would be a human-centric approach to artificial intelligence. And we have served that agenda well with our text. There are protections. I won't add to what Brando has already said about how seriously we have taken the prohibitions of use of artificial intelligence in the text, how seriously we have looked at the high-risk applications and the mechanisms to make sure also that we're not limiting unnecessarily how high-risk applications would be uh, forced into compliance. We have introduced something that again was not in the initial proposal, which is redress. Redress for our citizens, for our users, because they need to be able to say whenever they feel uneasy about technology, and that goes into the issue of trust and confidence, whenever they would feel uneasy about their interaction with AI, they need to have the possibility to say so. And again, we have introduced redress in the text. We have fundamental rights impact assessments for the deployment of high-risk applications. So the agenda of serving, the serving the agenda of protecting our citizens is very firmly into this mandate. And at the same time, this is why I said balance. At the same time, we are also serving the agenda of promoting innovation, not hindering creativity and deployment and development of AI in Europe, which is something that is an objective just as important as the one to protect our citizens. And throughout the work that we have done over the last year, we have tried to build on what was already in the proposal to make it so. First of all, definitions. 
We have worked hard and it wasn't easy. There was an ideological battle also in this house on definitions, but we achieved to have a definition that is not only clear in terms of what AI is, but it is a terminology that is perfectly aligned with the OECD definition, with the US definition. That means that we can achieve AI alignment and help also our companies to have a level playing field with others when developing AI. At the same time, we have a very, gave a very clear mandate for standard setting, something that in previous legislations of the EU, such as GDPR, we did not do. And then we left companies to struggle with legal definitions that they had difficulties in understanding or translating into technical language. And with standards, and we have only and also looked at how we write standards. Should it be top down or should it be bottom up? And we have agreed in this house that there will be bottom up standard setting again to make sure that those developing AI have a say in how these technical standards would look like. And that is something that helps that agenda of promoting innovation. Sandboxes, governance, again, other examples of how we thought that we need to bring in uh, industry, we need to bring in the developers, the startups, those creatives that are already embracing and using this technology so that they also find a place in Europe. And that's something that, again, for us was fundamentally important. Second thing, very briefly, on convergence. Uh, <clears throat> Brando has already touched upon that. For us, global convergence is something very important, and we do not look at this act as something where the Brussels effect will suffice. I said it many times in public, we have to look at Brussels effect differently this time around. Because this technology is the same everywhere. And therefore we have to, us as European Union, taking the lead on this, being the first ones to have the courage to put rules into place, but we also have to work with other like-minded democracies out there to make sure that we reach alignment on the global stage on how the signposting for the future, how the guard railing for the future in the evolution of this technology looks like and is aligned with the efforts of our partners. And third, I also said it yesterday in the plenary debate, if this technology and this transformation, this profound transformation takes place by leaving people behind, then we have missed our goal. It is fundamental that we bring everyone along. And that means that apart from writing rules, our governments and us here at the European level as well, we have to engage in a very serious and coordinated effort to explain and to accompany our citizens in this transformation. That means that we have to invest massively in education, in reskilling of our current workforce to be able to integrate AI into their work because otherwise, otherwise we would have forces in our societies that will resist, that will look at this transformation with a bad eye, and that's something that we do not want. It becomes ideological, it becomes partisan, and it's not how we see technology in our society. So we are mindful of all of these three objectives. We will continue to be mindful in the work that we'll do in the Council, and I'm convinced that uh, we will prevail with a text that will indeed set the right standard for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have some time for questions. So anyone in the room? Quite a few people. Um, I think uh, you were first over there. Um, yes, let's we'll start uh, all the way in the back. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke about uh, the ban on real-time biometric identification remaining in the position. How do you expect that to uh, to pan out when it comes to negotiations with the council? And what do you say to digital rights campaigners that say this should have gone further toward a ban, for example, in uses around uh, migration border controls? Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> maybe I will start with the second uh, part of the question. Uh, because we did discuss very seriously in our uh, negotiating team on the issue of uh, migration and border management. And our decision, which was a decision that was supported by all political groups, was that um, we will deal with artificial intelligence that is used in the context of migration management and border management as high-risk applications, which does bring a very serious responsibility on the side of those developing or deploying this technology in the context of migration and border management. It does come with a very clear set of obligations in terms of 
transparency, in terms of explainability, in terms of redress as well, which I mentioned earlier, which is very important, in terms of a fundamental rights impact assessment, because it is a high-risk application. So we think that this brings a necessary balance in the way migration and borders would be managed. And then when it comes to, to uh, remote biometrics, again, we have also, as you could probably imagine, spent hours uh, negotiating this until today. And we did have a deal, and, we, and that deal passed today, uh, a deal that we thought brings that balance. We have seriously looked at the interests of society and, and our citizens in terms of privacy, and this is why we have gone one step further than the Commission by taking away the exclusions for law enforcement, but we did not do it without thinking at the issue of safety and security of our citizens. And we introduced another part of that article where we say that biometric identification can still be used with the right judicial authorization right after the image collection takes place. So we have, again, tried to weigh in and, and balance out uh, the, the two interests. And when it comes to negotiations with the Council, like with everything else, uh, we, we have our position now, our mandate. Um, the Council has theirs, and we will have to find a solution sitting at the table. I just want to add one thing on the first point, and that was the second. In fact, the one on migration that, uh, um, in fact, we, uh, through strong negotiation, we, we found, however, a, a further common point on the issue of uh, emotion recognition. Uh, that we have uh, uh, banned also, um, uh, not just in employment uh, uh, places and in schools, but also when dealing with uh, uh, the migration issues, because we uh, uh, think that there is a limit also to the, uh, what, what can be done. And as colleague Dragos has said, we have put that in high risk, and uh, we think this needs to be taken seriously. So we will uh, um, look uh, in the negotiations so that this uh, doesn't get down as a standard that we have uh, that we have uh, put, I think, very uh, very uh, uh, clearly. Because this is a very sensitive topic, and it, we need to keep our eyes open. And on the trilogues, well, they start now, so uh, we have our position, and we will see what will happen. We will negotiate as we always have done. Right, thank you. And then I believe there was one next uh, there, please. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes, is the mic? Sorry, your mic is not on. Please press the button until the red light turns on. Okay, yes, perfect. Is that working? Uh, Lisa O'Carr from The Guardian. Two things, just a quick follow up on that question there. In France, the French police are intending to use facial recognition to prevent crowd surges and other things. Um, if this law if in the Olympics, if this law is passed by the end of the year, do you think that can still go ahead? Just comment on that. And then secondly, Dragos, you mentioned sanctions. Can you, you say, can you tell us what they would look like? And what, what talk about that, thanks. So, um, it's not for me to comment on what the French Assembly will do. If the French Assembly will decide to pass a law uh, that allows for biometric identification in public spaces now, until the regulation kicks in, until the regulation takes into force, then they take the responsibility of doing it for a very short period of time. <laughs> because when the regulation will pass, it will be applicable and enforceable in all member states. Um, so then the French Assembly will have to take its course to make sure that they comply with EU regulations. Sanctions, sorry. Uh, we, we have, I'm, I often get the question, uh, does this law have teeth? Uh, I always invite people to look into the text. There's plenty of sharp teeth in there that ranges from investigations and an and actual interaction, which is also a first wave, a friendly wave of interaction between the regulator and the companies, but then if the regulators would be unsatisfied with either what they find or what the uh, corrective measures the companies are taking, then they have the possibility either to force the withdrawal of the particular application from the market, so simply that application will no longer uh, work for us in the union, or there is also the possibility of fines that can go all the way to 7% of the revenue which I think is pretty convincing. 
up to seven. There is a range of sanctions depending on the type of infringement. Right, thank you. And then I believe you were next. Thank you. Anna Vandensky from Europe Diplomatic. I presume these uh, rules are so important for the elections uh, that we have to know that there will be no foul game, that they will be really reinforced. And I would like to hear the answer, first of all, of Madam President, uh, that how you are going to reinforce it, that the elections are exemplary and people feel confident that there is no foul game behind. Thank you for this question. I was going to come in with it uh, if none of you had asked it. Uh, it is a concern um, exactly one year before the elections next year. The AI Act uh, has a transposition time of two years, which means that it will not uh, be in force uh, on the t date of the election, but the Digital Services Act will be. Uh, it enters into force on the 1st of September. Uh, and that means that that act can help fight disinformation uh, and interference in elections, first of all, by providing rules on how to remove uh, illegal content. In fact, the AI Act would regulate systems that could be used to create and spread such uh, content. So this is also something that we need uh, to keep in mind uh, when it becomes effective in different uh, member states. Now, uh, if we look at the Parliament position uh, on uh, uh, the AI, AI Act, it expressly, in fact, considers uh, as high-risk uh, systems that are intended to, to, to influence outcomes uh, of uh, elections or referenda or the voting behaviour of national persons. So this is to say that we are very concerned. We are working uh, with the Commission, in fact, um, uh, in the absence of an electoral law, in order for us to have systems put in place. Some of them will have to be similar uh, to what we found in 2019 in terms of advertising, in terms of information, um, uh, um, control, not control, monitoring. How do you get the, the, the truth, the correct uh, information coming to your devices? We have a specific concern in this parliament is that we have four countries that will vote for the first time at age of 16 which means that that's a specific new electorate cohort that will get its information in a different way uh, to what other generations do, or previous elections sought to get the information. So that's together with our communication services, we are really very much looking at how we can work not only with the Commission, but also with uh, social media platforms, uh, in, especially after the 1st of September, where they will have to abide by our rules. Um. If I can add on, on, on this uh, specifically on, on what we are uh, doing now, I mean, the, the, from the side of the work on the AI Act, I, I mean, we, uh, not, not surprisingly, exactly on generative AI and the most, uh, uh, I mean, at risk of creating disinformation AI systems, we have a lot of debate around anticipation of compliance uh, in a voluntary base. Uh, or on a G7 level agreement on a code of conduct. This kind of work is being done also by the Commission. As I sh said earlier, we, 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 we share this effort and we understand that. I've been like Dragos traveling all over the world to discuss about this uh, work and generative AI has been at the center of the attention of, of a, a, a lot of institutions. Um, that's also why I think it will be very important that we conclude uh, quickly our work, uh, that the AI Act enters into force, and I say that on a personal uh, capacity, because this is something that we need to discuss further, but I think we should look into the possibility of having an um, earlier implementation for some systems, so for generative AI and foundation models. This is something that is, uh, I mean, it's totally to be discussed. It's my personal opinion, but I, I, I think this comes out after these discussions that on these specific areas, we might try to see if we can uh, accelerate uh, a bit the entry into force, considering that even if we don't manage to do that, there are voluntary um, uh, compliance uh, initiatives going on, uh, both for the businesses in Europe with the AI Pact and uh, at a G7 level on generative AI for the AI Code of Conduct. But maybe we could also take a step further on the legislative uh, hard law side. Right, thank you. And here in the front row, please. Hi, Angelina Deutsch Bloomberg. Um, I wanted to ask about the generative AI controls added today. 
Um, a lot of the big tech American companies that are actually creating this technology, they argue these controls should only be in place if these um, systems are used in high-risk situations. I'd be curious why you disagree with them, why they should just have blanket um, uh, controls and, and risk assessments. And I was also curious about member states, and if you are concerned at all about them, maybe not being willing to, to actually add controls, general purpose AI or generative AI. Thanks. But I, I maybe also Dragos want to say on this, but I, I can only say that uh, it's, um, uh, we, we have been working on this topic uh, because we think it's very uh, important to, to deal with. We concentrated on transparency because we think uh, this is the main thing. Then if generative AI is used in a context uh, of high risk use cases, then it will also comply with the general high risk areas. And also the foundation models that are behind the generative AI have some rules uh, for, for them to be into uh, our uh, uh, EU context. In general, the idea is that we want uh, responsibilities not to end up in the hands of uh, institutions and, uh, and, uh, and smaller businesses that use AI, but rather have enough responsibility by the developers, by the providers. This is, the, the I would say, one general principle, that uh, to have a, a healthy and balanced uh, chain of, of responsibilities. And the member states, well, they didn't work a lot on the topic because they concluded in December. Let's see if they want to do something else before we enter into the, 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 the strong phase of the negotiations. But however, I've seen a constructive approach. I've seen from the governments a great interest of regulating. So uh, I think that the approach that the parliament has taken can probably be uh, largely supported. This is our hope, but I, I see good signals in this sense with a lot of interlocu interlocutions I had with the, with the council, both me, Dragos, and the other involved MEPs. Thank you. Maybe one, one thing to add on generative AI. Um, because we have also ourselves thought very seriously um, how best to approach generative AI. And we could have gone down the path of saying only if generative AI is used in high risk uh, areas, then it should be coming under the uh, compliance regime of the regulation. But that would have denied the very nature of generative AI and foundational models, which is something that we have taken very seriously. And listening and reading and debating this also in the context of the Special Committee on AI, which we had in this parliament, and we had the foresight, and, and, and I want to thank the, the leadership of parliament for, for having that foresight and, and giving us that tool which we used well, I think, as, as regulators to understand generative AI. We realized that there are some intrinsic risks in generative AI that go beyond its, its use. It is in the very nature that they are built, in the very nature that they are exposed to large amounts of data that can then generate content that will actually be breaking the law. And we see already harmful effects of the content generated by uh, foundational models. We see them almost in daily news. And there is also the issue of copyrighted material which is used in training algorithms. And we had a lot of, I think, large parts of the creative industries of authors out there who said, listen, our rights, we need to at least know if our work has been used to train the algorithm. And then, of course, we have the legislation uh, is already in place to use and to make sure that our rights are protected. But at least we need to know. And that's precisely what we did. We crafted a special regime for generative AI that does not look at the use but looks at the, at the way uh, these models are built. And we have said these are some minimum rules that we think need to be respected. Number one, diligence towards the content that you produce, and number two, transparency. That's the only thing we ask, transparency when copyrighted material is used for the training of the algorithms. Right, thank you. At this stage, I believe uh, we have to let President Metzola go to her next engagement, um, but we will continue the press conference with the other rapporteurs. Thank you. Um, yes, and next question in the room over there. And, yes. Thank you, uh, Luca Bertuzzi from your active. I have two questions related to the EPP amendments on remote biometric identification. Uh, first of all, where does, does that leave you in terms of your relations with the EPP as you walk into the trilogues? Does that mean that the EPP voice will be somewhat marginalized? 
during the trilogue negotiations? And secondly, do you think that even though not successful, uh, these amendments managed to weaken the parliament position vis-a-vis -vis the council? Thank you. I could even answer in Italian now, but uh, I, I, I will not because I, uh, it would be easier in English for everyone. Um, I, I think that uh, what happened today shows that uh, uh, agreements should be respected. Because if you break them, uh, we are uh, mature enough as a, as a parliament and the work of, of uh, political groups to uh, organize to stop uh, the trial to break agreements. So uh, this uh, uh, tentative completely failed, and I think this I'm sure will bring EPP with a more responsible attitude back at the table. We need uh, them like we need the other groups, especially um, if you look, uh, we had a large majority support in the final vote, which includes also EPP that you mentioned. So we want to keep this large support uh, to the act. And uh, I just say that today we have seen that it's better to respect pacts. Otherwise, you, you lose... Uh, uh, your face also, and the results that you, you can obtain. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, on this topic that was at the center of this uh, more tense situation, we will need to negotiate with the, with, the, with the governments. But I think that exactly the result of today give us even a stronger position. It's clear that the parliament don't want us to recede on such important topics uh, on uh, avoiding mass surveillance. So I, I think it's, a, it's even a clearer mandate. Thank you. All right, and then in the front row, please. Allora, chiederò in italiano a Brando Benifei, eh, appunto, proprio sul tema dell'intelligenza artificiale, se spesso viene, diciamo, sottolineato come non si può fermare il progresso, no? Eh, lo si può normare, forse. Non, non avete magari la sensazione che mettere tutte queste regole a un qualcosa che addirittura in questo momento non riescono a gestire nemmeno i propri creatori possa in qualche modo essere visto, soprattutto penso anche dalla parte degli Stati Uniti, che poi diciamo in questo momento sono coloro i quali eh, gestiscono questa tecnologia come una sorta di tentativo di fermare un qualcosa di, mh, che è proprio in uno stato nascente, ecco, mettiamo così. Devo dire che questo tipo di reazioni, di mh, perplessità sulla nostra azione, le ho trovate eh, magari un po' di tempo fa, un, un anno fa, quando sono stato a discutere con legislatori di altri paesi, inclusi gli Stati Uniti. Um, ma oggi invece l'atteggiamento a me pare assai diverso. Mi pare che molti provano a raggiungerci in qualche modo, ad aprire eh, dibattiti come quelli che noi abbiamo fatto all'inizio di questa legislatura, in chiave non legislativa. Drago Studorace è stato presidente della Commissione di Studio sull'Intelligenza Artificiale, AIDA, um, e mi sembra che oggi tutti vogliano in realtà eh, lavorare per arrivare a delle regole. Magari l'Europa le fa più vincolanti per come siamo fatti, per come siamo abituati, ma anche negli Stati Uniti, in Giappone, in Brasile, in Canada, stanno discutendo esattamente di sistemi di verificabilità e di mitigazione del rischio, di regole sui dati, di regole sull'AI generativa. Magari sono più indietro rispetto all'idea di fare delle leggi, però stanno discutendo delle stesse questioni, almeno nei contesti democratici. Dunque noi riteniamo anzi di aver anticipato una tendenza che magari con differenze fra i paesi a seconda delle nostre culture, noi abbiamo una legislazione di tutela dei consumatori molto più elevata di qualunque altra parte del mondo e quindi questo ha un impatto, una cultura della tutela della privacy superiore, quindi questo ha dell'impatto su il risultato finale, però il principio di occuparci di questi beni messi a rischio dall'intelligenza artificiale a me pare assai condiviso. Quindi credo invece che se sapremo mantenere l'equilibrio tra sostegno all'innovazione e anche alla libertà di sperimentare, ad esempio con le sandboxes obbligatorie che noi abbiamo inserito a sostegno proprio dello sviluppo di start-up, di nuove idee di business, ma chiedendo invece a chi può eh, agli sviluppatori di fare la propria parte per ridurre o eliminare i rischi, penso che invece tracceremo una strada che con il resto del mondo ci permetterà di confrontarci e anche di costruire un eh, sistema globale di regole. 
Thank you. I believe we could now take a question online since Alfonso has been waiting for some time. Please press the speak button. Uh, hello, Alfonso Bianchi, Europa Today, Italy. I'm sorry to go back on the facial recognition in real time. I just have a question because uh, before you start the, the press conference, uh, Margaret Vestager uh, commented on the vote and she said that the Commission still support. She said two well-rounded exceptions. One should be uh, for when there is a child missing and police is searching for the child, and another one is when there is a terrorist attack and there is someone on the run. Uh, you said that you still need uh, want a judge to approve something like that, but this seems to be not something that could be easily done because it seems to me that these are emergency situation decisions that should be taken in uh, very fast uh, time. So on this point, do you think you will be able to find an agreement or do you think this is going to be a red line even because the vote of today, uh, you turned down an amendment of DP that was just asking for these two rounded exceptions? Thank you. Well, I al always said that in a negotiation you don't go with the red lines, you go with mandates. So we have a mandate that was very clear that was adopted today. And the Council has a mandate that is also very clear and that was adopted in the Council. And the Commission has made a proposal and I think it's only natural that they defend that proposal. Uh, so that's about red lines and negotiations. Now in terms of substance, our belief is that you can serve the interest of protecting citizens, whether children being abducted or terrorists that are attacking the streets, with the technology as it stands. Biometric identification is in fact an exact science and it already works. The Schengen Information System, which is by the way the system and the biometric matching system behind the Schengen Information System, which is the biometric search engine that every law enforcement in Europe is using, is already active since more than 10 years and does not work with artificial intelligence. And if there is a terrorist right now running the streets outside or if law enforcement is being told that a, ch a child is missing and might be with the abductor in the streets, then footage from CCTV can be taken in accordance with the rules as we have right now in our mandate. And then with the judicial authorization, which also in the EPP amendments you will find, which is normal to have, you can go and do your biometric matching. So that is why I said that already in the context that we have developed, and again, we have taken our time to seriously consider finding that balance that we need to find, uh, I think both objectives can be well served. But again, we will go into negotiations with the Commission, with the Council, each of us with our mandates, and we will try to find a deal as we always do. Thank you. Anyone in the room with another question? Oh, there in the back, please. Thank you. Um, in the U.S. every month, uh, more and more voice cloning, frauds and deep fakes are bringing the issue of AI into the agenda. Uh, is the European Parliament concerned about the issue and how the legislators across Europe can protect their citizens from these AI malpractices? Well, uh, yes, we are worried about this, and you also know that this is not connected only to AI. This could be done also without AI, with simple <laughs> um, faking things um, and uh, uh, using uh, uh, social media. So on one hand, the, as uh, uh, President Metzola said, uh, the Digital Services Act, which again was something that uh, to connect to a previous question, was big. At the beginning, I found a lot of legislators from outside the EU saying, ah, but this is a protectionist, this is a too much, this is... Uh, now the debate is how we do something similar and how we implement it. Um, the discussion about uh, um, uh, how we protect from uh, our democracy from this is already ongoing with some existing instruments. But clearly, the AI Act will give more instruments because it will uh, act on the uh, AI-generated uh, deepfakes um, in the context of the generative AI by um, uh, uh, creating all the safeguards to make this identifiable and not confuse uh, reality with, uh, uh, with, fake, with fake news. 
we see the potential to um, make it uh, even worse than how it is today, because still today we have problems. And when people, because it happens to me, discussing on these topics that people tell me, but shouldn't we rely on education? Shouldn't we tell people that they should have multiple sources, that they will? Yes, we need to do that. But until now, it's clear that this is not sufficient. We should do that, but we also need safeguards that are applicable that in this case can make deep fakes identifiable and so uh, um, make them for what they are, fiction, not uh, uh, reality, not something that should uh, inform our public debate. Thank you. We also have a question in the chat, which I can read out. Uh, so on the timetables, what are the odds of this act taking effect just before the parliament elections of June 2024? Um, I presume uh, Val means uh, being finally approved after trilogues. Well, I think the odds are very good that we will finish negotiations this year. We have a clear commitment on the side of the presidency of the council for that, and certainly we are committed to make that happen. Um, and we are pretty confident that this actually can be finished by the end of the year. Then is the question of entering into force, which is a different discussion right now in the proposal, we have a two-year period. And if I might add my personal view to Brando's personal view earlier, I also think that in light of the sense of urgency that we now see uh, everywhere on actually bringing rules even quicker, some months ago, people were saying that we are too fast. Now, yes. now people are worried that, that we are too slow with the legislation coming into force. Uh, I think that in the negotiations with the Council and with the Commission, uh, this is one aspect that we can look at. We have to be very careful because it's not only the issue of making sure that there is enough time for companies to comply, but from my point of view, an even more serious issue is will our member states and our governments have the time to mount up the type of expertise in the authorities that will be taking the role of market regulators? And I think that's a very serious question uh, and we cannot just play with the dates uh, for, to serve that sense of urgency. But spe specifically to the question, I don't see how it can actually come into force before elections next year. They are in June, so that is virtually impossible. Uh, and we will see in the trilogues uh, what is the best date for entry into force. Thank you. I think we have time for one final question before we have to wrap up. Um, there, in the back corner, please. Thank you. So, does this legislation set a burden to the general usage of generative AI? Like, practically, what exactly would change in ChatGPT if this legislation was enforced today? And secondly, in the same time, does it leave space for the development of the European equivalent of ChatGPT? Well, the answer to the second one is very simple. I can make it quick, yes. Uh, I think there is plenty of space, and it's not the legislation that would uh, hinder the development of a European ChatGPT. There are other things. Developing a model like ChatGPT requires resources, enormous resources. People don't talk about that. And it is access to those resources and access to that type of funding that might be more of a hindrance in the way of European businesses than these rules. So that's the second part of the question. And the first question, uh, on the generative AI, uh, our rules are on three levels. First, so if the rules will be enforced today, what ChatGPT will need to do is, number one, mind the interests of those down the, down, downstream of the value chain to make sure that they pass on the information they need for them to comply if they go into high-risk areas. Number two, they'll have to be transparent about the data sets that they used in training ChatGPT, how ChatGPT functions, the basic parameters of the system. And number three, and most importantly, the two specific things for generative AI, for example, for ChatGPT, i.e., they would have to show that they have, in the course of developing and designing their algorithm, they have seriously uh, considered the lawfulness of the content that might be produced. Now I have a question mark if they did ask that question when they developed. And number two, they would have to reveal all of the copyrighted material that they use in the training of the algorithm. They have to document it we say comprehensively document and be transparent about that. This is, this is what ChatGPT will have to do tomorrow if the legislation will come into force. Thank you. 
Okay, I think that is all we have time for today. There are other engagements coming, so thank you very much for everyone following and uh, 